stepped outside the universe of Darwin, we now evolve in a new and unique way. There has, of course, been an increase in human brain size and in human brain complexity when we compare ourselves with our relatives in primates, in carnivores, in rodents and the like. But if you go back and look at the fossil record, and the human brain's about three or four times bigger weight for weight than the chimpanzee brain, but if you go, body size for body size, if you go back in the fossil record for humans, the surprising thing is actually how little change there has been recently. Here's a slightly confusing graph because the uh, parameters are uh, perhaps back to front. There's today on the left, all the way back to three and a half million years ago, Neanderthals, Homo erectus, all that stuff. And certainly over three and a half million years or so, um, human brains get bigger. Interestingly enough, our brains, our skull cap um, capacity, has actually gone down a little since the first modern humans about 150,000 years ago. But apart from, we really haven't changed at all physically from the first modern humans. Um, it's, uh, we've changed, of course, utterly in other ways. I have the dubious um, privilege of living in Camden Town. Now, if a Cro-Magnon young man, an early modern human, was to come and sit next to me on the tube, um, I probably wouldn't notice. Um, he might be covered in mud and grunting a bit, but this is Camden Town, after all. Um, and I might move one seat away from him. Um, but take it from his point of view, he'd be utterly baffled. There'd be all these strange people traveling at speed underground, um, making ch chirping noises and waving big leaves in front of their faces. What in the hell was going on? Physically, ourselves and Cro-Magnons are, I'm sure, indistinguishable. But in every interesting way, in every other way, we're utterly different. Obviously, what's happened, we've evolved in our brains, uh, in our thoughts, and, and not in our brains, in our structures. So what's the story? Where does all this come from? Well, the story is more complex, I'm sure, than the one I'm going to give you. But one version of it has to do, to go back to our friend Mr. William Jones, with the origin of language. But of course, as Jones himself realized, language is genetics. Genetics is a language. And once we've got language the capacity to pass information in another way, everything changes. You can pass it not just down the generations, you can pass it sideways. Um, you can pass it at a much greater speed. You can write it down. You can fossilize your own information in the way that nature does so rarely. So it has to do, perhaps, with the origin of language. And one well-known story, which, again, for those people in the trade in the room, but I know is overstated, has to do with a particular condition called verbal dyspraxia. And this has to do, this is an illness, a genetic disease, which is very, very rare, which is occasionally children are born who are say, physically healthy, seem intelligent and able on most tests um, uh, of, of ability, but are quite unable to deal with language. They can't learn to speak, they can't, um, they can't comprehend language at all, and if you take one of these gaudy icons of quasi-science, as I like to call them, brain scans, um, you can see that on, the, um, on, on both sides, in, the, in normal people, just the left hemisphere of the brain is active in Broca's area when they're speaking. In these people with this particular damaged gene, uh, everything's gone haywire. There's activity all over the brain. The gene's called FOXP2, first found in fruit flies, who are not a very, not a very eloquent bunch of creatures, I have to say. Uh, it does plenty of other things, but when it's disrupted, it interferes with language. Now, if you compare that gene in humans and our relatives, it's actually rather interesting. There have been a number of changes in the gene, but most of the changes are in parts of the DNA which don't, as far as we can see, have any real function. Okay? They're silent. They don't produce any protein. However, certain changes have changed the physical structure of the protein that that gene makes. And they're shown as gray blocks rather than black lines. And you'll see there are two changes which have changed the structure in that protein compared to uh, all the other primates, nearly all the other primates. So maybe it was language that made us human in the first place. I think the evidence isn't that great. There's more interesting stuff about that. Very recently it's turned out that that gene is more active in birds like parrots that can be taught to speak, perhaps without much comprehension, than in birds like chickens that can't be taught to speak. What that means, I don't know, but it suggests, again, it has something to do with understanding um, um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the nature of speech. So speech and language gives us this new form of evolution. We're unique. We're the... Um, we're, we're the only creature that can, um, that can uh, understand the past and predict and do something about the future because of this great ability. And that, of course, completely changes our evolutionary position in comparison to everything else. Let's talk about HIV. Well, HIV is spreading, 
but a lot of good work is being done, which no other primate could possibly do. Here's a result, recent paper from the journal Science, um, which shows the patterns of sexual behavior in Manikaland, which is in the southwest of Zimbabwe, um, after an education program which told people of the dangers of HIV and what their behavior ought to be. And Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe has a big, big problem. And you can see, um, for men and women, left and right, in 2001, which is the, uh, after the education program, the number of people with large numbers of partners, five or more, is much less for men and women, both men and women, and the numbers with either zero or one partners um, has, has, has tended, quite strikingly, to go up. So that's something which we've taught ourselves. We've changed our evolutionary future in a way which only we could do. Now, education is important without question, but of course we in the West can do much, much more. Um, now, of course, uh, um, and actually uh, that effect, that, uh, I'll skip over that, it's had quite an effect on the spread of HIV. We in the West can do much more. We can actually use our language, our science, our understanding accumulated over the past to design drugs to hit the virus. Here are the vi various places you might be able to design drugs um, in order to attack HIV, and of course there's been a lot of success. The chemistry is a bit hair-raising. Hair there are three nucleoside inhibitors, some kind of drug. Here are some, something that attacks another part of the HIV um, virus, an integrase, as it's called. And here's a really alarming chemical, God knows how they made that, um, which uh, attacks another part of the virus's cycle. And that's been very successful. Here is a picture that shows the pattern of life and death in the United States since this multi-drug therapy was actually um, uh, generated. Here we have the patterns of rate of death from 1987 through to 1995 when the drugs began to work and you can see a complete collapse. Okay? No other primate, of course, no other animal could do anything like that. We've entirely altered our evolutionary future in a unique way, a way which no other creature could do. There are intelligent designers out there, but they work for drug companies. They're us. They're not up in the sky. Okay? So it's unique. And of course, all the stuff that makes us interesting is unique. We're 98% DNA sharing with chimpanzees. We're 50% DNA sharing with bananas. I don't know whether it's above or below the waist, but we're not 98% chimpanzee or 50% banana. We're 100% human. Okay? And evolution is very bad at dealing with things about with that are unique. I'll illustrate that with a, an old joke, which I know some of you may have heard already, which comes from language. It's a joke which my father told me many years ago, not realizing he was talking about evolution, neither did I at the time. Um, I was, when I was young, I, I was born in Aberystwyth in West Wales and lived there for several years, and my first language, as you can probably tell, wasn't English. Um, Aberystwyth was in those days a very Welsh-speaking town, and still is, as, as, long, as long as there are English people in the room, that is. Um, <laughs> plenty, of people speak English, plenty of people speak Welsh. And the story goes that somebody went into a Chinese restaurant in Aberystwyth and was served a very good Chinese meal by a clearly Chinese waiter who spoke perfect Welsh. Well, the customer was astounded by this, so he beckoned over the uh, owner, and he asked him in Welsh, and I'll translate for your delectation, he asked him, well, where do you get this astonishing man, a Chinaman who speaks Welsh? The owner looked terribly alarmed and said, keep your voice down, boy -o. he thinks he's learnt English. <laughs> and that actually illustrates the problem of uniqueness. Because from a Chinese speaker's point of view, Welsh and English are only dialects of the same European language. And of course, he's right. From our point of view, Chinese is a language. Of course it isn't. There are six, at least six different Chinese languages, some of which are incomprehensible.